Hello, um, we did it. <laughs> Last week we looked at the muscles of the anterolateral abdominal wall and I haven't been distracted. I got a little bit distracted about a layer of the retina that causes the reflection in cats and dogs eyes and other nocturnal animals and that sort of thing. But no, I'm still on track. We're going to talk about the muscles of the posterior abdominal wall. Well, mostly the muscles. We want to talk about the vertebrae. Um, we want to talk about the fascia. Um, and we want to, you know, it, th there's a shape thing here that I'm really keen on that you get. But that's the focus is the muscles of the posterior abdominal wall. However, there is a lot of stuff there and I might have to point at the odd thing and say, hey, look at that, look at this, look at that. Oh, this is cool, isn't it? And that sort of thing, right? So I'm not gonna apologize for that. So the thorax is up here, the chest, the abdomen is down here, the pelvis is down here. There is a really good divider between the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity, and that's the diaphragm. And the diaphragm is also going to form part of the posterior abdominal wall. So bear that in mind, we will look at it. But look, these are the vertebral bodies of the lumbar vertebrae down here, thoracic vertebrae up here. And as we, as we descend, you know, those vertebrae have got to take more weight, right? The lower you go, the more weight there is above them. And as we're bipedal, standing upright and stuff, that's particularly pronounced in humans. So these lumbar vertebrae get really big. So if we've got muscles running between the vertebrae and other things, those vertebral bodies are gonna stick out into the posterior abdominal wall. Bear that in mind as we're looking at these sorts of things. Okay, thank you. So, yoink. All right, so thorax abdomen. So here's the diaphragm here. Now look how it's curving around. The diaphragm is a flat sheet of muscle or muscles with a couple of crura legs sticking down posteriorly anchoring it. I'm sure I've done a video about the diaphragm um, with a flattened tendon in the middle. But you see this curve shape here that we see in this coronal section Keep imagining that curve all the way around to the anterior abdominal wall and posterior abdominal wall, okay? Let me take this apart. So if I take the gastrointestinal tract out, look, look how the diaphragm is it's curving around and curving around. So part of the posterior abdominal wall is formed by the diaphragm. These are the crura here. There's the esophagus. Do you see, see these strips down here? Anyway. So we can't see the entire posterior abdominal wall because we still have some organs in the way. Spleen, kidneys, inferior vena cava, aorta. Um, although uh, taking, the, taking the liver out has taken away a big chunk of the inferior vena cava. But can you see how these blood vessels, they are anterior to those vertebral bodies that I was talking about. So they're pushed out. So they're like further into the middle of the abdomen and either side there are like two gutters, two recesses that the kidneys and what have you are sat in. All right, do you see what I mean? There's the vertebrae. These are the gutters here and here. It's kind of difficult to appreciate that shape. But that, those are the spaces we've got of the posterior abdominal wall. And if you're going to take anything home, I think that one's quite an important one. So what about the muscles of the posterior abdominal wall then? Well, if the diaphragm is one of them, I think probably the next most obvious one is this one here. That's psoas major. This is a really chunky muscle. And it's, um, it's a long muscle, one on either side. And it's running from the transverse processes of... Uh, the lumbar vertebrae and T12, so T12, L1, L2, L3, L4, L5. What do I mean by that? I mean, these are the lumbar vertebrae. These are the transverse processes here, sticking out transversely. The reason we've got transverse processes is they're great for attaching muscles to bone. So we've got this big muscle that's attaching to all of these vertebrae, and then it runs down, and it actually runs down to the femur. 
So on the femur, we have a greater trochanter out here and a lesser trochanter. See this lump here? Um, again, it's a lump. This is where a muscle attaches. So solus major runs down here, deep to the inguinal ligament, which is running across there, if you know about it. So it stays close to the bone. It inserts into the lesser trochanter. This means that it is a major hip flexor. That is, it flexes the femur at the hip joint. When it contracts, it flexes the femur. So it flexes the femur at the hip joint. It does, it does this. Now, because there's one on either side and they're connecting the vertebrae to the lower limb, you know, they could also pull, if the limbs are fixed in place, they could pull the vertebrae to either side so they could take part in lateral flexion of the vertebrae or lateral flexion of the trunk. But we think of the psoas major muscle as the hip flexor. So it's running like that, bunk, bunk. So that's this tough muscle that we see here, that's psoas major. And you can see there's actually a very, there's like a thin strip of muscle running on its anterior surface, curving around here. This is um, psoas minor. Um, not all of us have a psoas minor muscle. It's a separate muscle to psoas major. It's surrounded by separate connective tissue, has different innervation. And this is actually running to the the superior ramus of the pubis bone, as in it's running to here. So it's not going to take part in hip flexion. It's only going that far. And it's probably coming from the vertebral bodies of um, T12 and L1, actually the vertebral bodies here. It's a small muscle. I think maybe 40% of us don't even have one. If it had a role, it would be in pulling these bones closer to these bones, so in in flexion of the trunk, but there are so many other far bigger, far more powerful trunk flexors that, you know, you ain't gonna miss it. But that's, so, that's why psoas major is called psoas major, because there's a psoas minor. What about nervous innervation of these muscles then? What nerve supplies innervation to the psoas major muscle? Well, because these muscles are so close to the vertebrae, and as we saw, they were, the, the psoas major muscle is attached to the transverse processes. They're right next to where the nerves are coming, where the spinal nerves are coming out of the spinal cord. So the nerves that are coming out, they just go to the muscle and they haven't even had time to say, hey, look, I'm forming a nerve, give me a name. We just have these nerve fibers running from the spinal nerves to the psoas major muscle at levels L1, L2 and L3 because it's just, it's there, it's plonked right on top of the, the lumbar plexus, the, the nerves that are coming out here. Okay, we might say it's the anterior rami, if that means anything to you, but um, there is no nerve to psoas major, the nerve just comes straight out of the spinal cord and bam, psoas major, and it innervates it, which I think is quite interesting. <laughs> psoas major, psoas minor, and then look at this one here. This, this is iliacus, so this bone here is this bone here. So this is the ilium, ilium, whatever you prefer. This is the wing here, this very flat bit. This is the crest. Uh, this is the anterior superior iliac spine. And iliacus is attached to this nice big flat curved surface of the, the wing of the ilium. Um, and also from the anterior superior iliac spine. And it also runs down to the lesser trochanter of the femur. So it can also flex the femur at the hip joint because it's crossing this hip joint here, but it's not running from the vertebrae to the femur. So it can't take part in flexion of the trunk or lateral flexion. It can't take part in any vertebral movement, only in this movement here. And the iliacus and psoas major muscles blend so that they form almost a single tendon that inserts at the lesser trochanter. So they often get referred to together as the iliopsoas, the powerful hip flexors. Um, the other fun thing here is that, look, look what we've done here. So if the muscle is running to the lesser trochanter here, if the hip is flexed and iliacus contracts, 
it can also laterally rotate the femur. But, you know, it can kind of do that when the leg's extended as well. But when the, when the hip is flexed, if you pull on that, you see what I mean? This is why iliacus also gets called a lateral rotator of the femur at the hip joint. So, so it's good, you know, anyway, so. Anyway, iliacus. Now, iliacus does have its, well, it doesn't have its own nerve, but it does have a particular nerve supplying it, and that's the femoral nerve. Um, we would see the femoral nerve running with the femoral vessels down here, which helps give you an idea of, of its path. Um, but the femoral nerve is going to innervate iliacus on its way down to the, the femur, the thigh, the anterior thigh. Um, and the femoral nerve comes from levels L2, L3 and L4 from the lumbar plexus again. So there we go, iliacus, psoas major, psoas minor. Hey, look, we've done most of it. Can you see this little muscle here and here? These are quadratus lumborum. Quadratus meaning they're kind of rectangular shaped lumborum, meaning they're in the lower back. This is a fairly flat muscle. And what we can see here is we can see the edge of the bone of the iliac crest. So iliacus is attaching to the wing of the ilium, the crest of the ilium, which you can palpate, right? That's what you're feeling around here, the bony bit around there. The iliac crest is where the quadratus lumborum muscle is coming from. Um, but it's also the, um, the vertebral column is anchored to the pelvis and there are some ligaments in here which anchor the two together and kind of act like the suspension bits of a suspension bridge and hold it all together. So there is an iliolumbar ligament. Ilio, ilium, lumbar, lumbar vertebrae. So the iliolumbar ligament is kind of a ligament, it's a really tough ligament that's running across here. So the quadratus lumborum muscle is coming from the iliac crest and the iliolumbar ligament. It's also going to attach to these transverse processes of um, L1 to L4. One, two, three, oh, hang on. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, that was right. One, two, three, four, five. So the transverse processes of L4, L3, L2, L1, and also look, the 12th rib here. So it plays a role in, in kind of like anchoring the, the 12th rib and then the rib cage as a whole because they're also attached to this. So while we can't see much of it on that model there, it's a pretty substantial flat posterior abdominal wall muscle. And it means that if it's gonna contract on one side, it'll pull the lumbar vertebrae closer to the pelvis, it'll help in lateral flexion to one side or the other. So lateral, lateral flexion to one side or the other. And then if they both contract, if the, if the vertebral column is, is flexed, they could help with extension. So if the vertebral column is flexed, they could help with extension. But again, don't forget what I said last week and that we have the pelvis because we have the lower limbs and these lower limbs are big, heavy, powerful things. So quadratus lumborum, is linking the pelvis to the lumbar vertebrae, is linking the lower limbs to the lumbar vertebrae via the pelvis. So if you're a runner like me, you know, it's worth bearing in mind. Um, again, like psoas major, because this is coming from the transverse processes is of those lumbar vertebrae, it's also going to receive the spinal nerves that come out of those levels, T12, L1, L2, L3, L4. We're just going to have the anterior rami, that is the anterior branches going this way, because the posterior rami, they're just branches that go to the deep muscles of the back. That's all we're talking about here. Anyway, the anterior rami of those spinal nerves are just going to go straight into quadratus lumborum, before any anatomist has had a chance to give them a name. But that's, those are the muscles then. So we've formed the posterior abdominal wall use, using the diaphragm, quadratus lumborum, iliacus, the psoas major. The psoas minor is mentioned for completeness' sake. And we have the vertebral bodies in the centre there. Now I said I would talk about fascia. 
more conceptually than anything else. So um, we rarely see fascia in plastic models. Um, we see fascia when we're dissecting, but then we remove it to show other things. So if you're looking at cadavers, you might not even see the fascia there. But fascia is important. It's a, a, a connective tissue sheet, a membrane. It can be really tough or not so tough. And it's what holds us together and gives us shape. Um, right, now each muscle, so muscles are held together by connective tissue. So we have myofibrils, the cells are bundled together. Those bundles are bundled together by more connective tissue. Those bundles of bundles are, are, connected, uh, are held together by more connective tissue until we have a functional muscle that pulls in a particular direction, be it a flat muscle or a fusiform muscle, you know, a rounded muscle like this. Now the outer layer of connective tissue surrounding that mass muscle can become fascia, part of another fascia. So there is fascia around iliacus, fascia around psoas major, fascia around quadratus lumborum. And remember that when we looked at the anterolateral abdominal wall muscles, we see this layer here. This is the transversus abdominis muscle. And this has a connective tissue layer on this internal surface and is wrapping around posteriorly. That's got a fascia. All of these fascias will blend together and then we'll give them another name. Um, and if they form stringy things, we call those ligaments. So really what we've got, like back here, kind of between the posterior, well, wrapping, like it's like surrounding that stuff. And we find it deep in the posterior abdominal wall is the thoracolumbar fascia. Thoracolumbar fascia. It's kind of this pyramidal shape down here. Latissimus dorsi, its fibers are coming from it. So that's what we're seeing here. So it's there, it's on that side. And the quadratus lumborum's connective tissue surrounding it, it's, it's like a connective tissue sheath. The anterior part of that is the anterior part of the thoracolumbar fascia. Do you see what I mean? So it's, it's, it's like you've got all these muscles and they're all wrapped up in their connective tissue and they all blend together to form this fascia. They're all tied together to form this unit. That's the thoracolumbar fascia in a nutshell, and that's the fascia of the posterior abdominal wall. And if you are aware that we have a peritoneum lining the abdominal cavity that then also covers the viscera, the organs, the gastrointestinal tract and forms the mesentery, that's a different thing. That's a serous membrane that's holding all these things together, producing a little bit of fluid and what have you. Between the peritoneum, and the muscles of the posterior abdominal wall, that's where we see this layer of fascia. But that concept of muscles are surrounded by connective tissue, those connective tissues can blur and blend together to form sheets, and that's what we're referring to when we talk about the fascia back here. It's a very difficult thing to visualize, but you know, that's, 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 there we go. Those are the muscles forming the posterior abdominal wall because again we have this gap between the pelvis and the ribs that we need to make a, a wall out of if we're going to form a tube and a trunk to keep all of our insides inside. And muscle is a great building block and it also means we've got good mobility and we can move around and what have you. Um, the one thing that we didn't see this back here is the lumbar plexus which also gets called the lumbosacral plexus because it links with the sacral plexus down here. These are nerves coming out from the lumbar levels and the sacral levels that form other nerves like the femoral nerve and also notably the sciatic nerve, but I've talked about that elsewhere. But they are right there in that posterior abdominal wall in the midst of it. All right, here we go. So posterior abdominal wall this week, muscles of the anterolateral abdominal wall last week and some other bits and bobs. Nice. Um, okay. Um, I think I've run out of things to talk about for five minutes. I'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.